Today is June the 5th, uh, 2002, and we're here in the offices of Roy Mann to do Roy's oral history. Roy, can you just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, you, you know, where you were raised and went to school and things like that? Where I was raised and went to school. Well, I was born in Granite City, Illinois. Came to California for the first time with my parents in 1923. Spent some time back in Illinois. Went to grammar school. Uh, started grammar school in Illinois. Then we moved to Glendale, California. Lived and grew up in Glendale. Uh, with an interval again in school in Illinois. Went to Hoover High in Glendale. Uh, went, enrolled. Um, I graduated from there in 1940. Went to uh, Caltech in Pasadena uh, until uh, I left there to go to war. I was in the Air Force as a meteorologist uh, for four years. And uh, when I came out, I went to UCLA. I, I got married, had babies, uh, went to UCLA, became a chemist, and uh, worked recently with Kodak. And then I decided, uh, after talking to a family friend, I go to law school to be a patent lawyer. Uh, after I got to law school, uh, I discovered I could do that better than I could do science. Uh, so I became a lawyer. Uh, I started practicing with a large law firm in Los Angeles, McCutcheons. Uh, they were primarily a San Francisco firm. Uh, because of uh, my classmate, uh, a man named George Grover, um, he'd been uh, editor-in-chief of the Southern California Law Review ahead of me. Uh, he and I had commuted to school together. I became editor-in-chief after he did. Uh, and uh, uh, he came out here because he clerked on the California Supreme Court with uh, uh, a fellow named Don Stark, and Don Stark came out here and uh, joined Walter Clayson, started the office where I am now, and uh, George got in touch with me, and I thought it would be a better place to raise my kids uh, than Los Angeles was going to be. I already could see that the commute was getting to be a bad thing in Los Angeles, so I came to Corona. Uh, Walter Clayson had done quite a lot of water work uh, in the Corona Riverside area because that was the nature of things in, in this area of the Riverside County when he came. And so Don Stark got into water law, and so I got into water law because I came to this office. In uh, late uh, 1950s, I came to Corona in 19... <clears throat> One. Um, in the late 1950s, a woman named Esther Cassell, uh, who was a desert land interman and whose sister was a desert land interman, uh, had hired an engineer by the name of Jack Woolley in Santa Ana uh, to help them develop the Palo Verde Mesa. They needed to get water on the mesa and uh, put in their crops in order to uh, get a patent on the land. So they were interested in, in getting a Mesa, a Mesa water project. How, how much land did they intend to develop, do you remember? Well, uh, the uh, contract, uh, the water delivery contract with the United States, the 740 Water Agreement, had provided for 16,000 acres on the Palo Verde Mesa. Uh, and, uh, the district had uh, included 16,000 acres of the Mesa in the district at that time. So that was the primary design objective that Mr. Woolley was working on to provide water for the Palo Verde Mesa. So it was for the full Mesa? Uh, no, it was for 16,000 acres of the Mesa. Well, uh, okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, the full 16,000. The full 16,000. The Mesa boundaries have never been really defined very well, and it's very difficult, geologically speaking, or orographically speaking, or whatever, to tell you exactly where the lower Palo Verde Mesa is, but the general 
area where the 16,000 acres is conceded to be on Mesa. Anyway, uh, uh, so Esther Cassell et al., uh, group of desert land entrymen, were my clients, and I went to work for them trying to get uh, a water project on the Palo Verde Mesa. Uh, that uh, gave rise to the district hiring me to be their attorney. The attorney for the district, uh, back during the formative days and when they were building the dam, was a man named Arvin Shaw. Arvin Shaw died. He was replaced by a man named Frank Jenny. Frank Jenny was the attorney for the district for some reason. Uh, I never really knew the, the whole reason. Uh, the board had become disenchanted with Mr. Jenny, and so they saw this new attorney who was working to get the Mesa water, and they wanted to hire me. They wanted me to come to Blythe, but I didn't want to go to Blythe. Uh, in fact, I had no intention of going to Blythe. Uh, <clears throat> so they went ahead and hired me anyway. And this was? And that was being uh, summer of 1962. Uh, after I became the district attorney, I continued to work and try to get water for the Mesa. That was primarily uh, the, the biggest thing that they were doing at that time. Since that time, I've been the attorney for the district, and our office still is attorneys for the district. Uh, and the primary job has been to try to protect their right to water. <laughs> because <laughs> even though the Seventh Party Water Agreement, uh, which, which is incorporated in the uh, water delivery contracts, uh, were the rules of the game, everyone has been finding whatever they can find to play around the rules of the game and get the water. So the primary job that I've had with regard to water for the district, uh, other than just administrative, matters for the district has been to try to protect their water. Now when you first started off with them, so to speak, in around 1962, uh, I guess the Arizona versus California case had already been litigated uh, substantially. There were Supreme Court arguments, um, I guess, yet to go. Did you yes, get involved I, in that? Well, I got involved in that, but uh, uh, only in the conferences uh, leading up to the argument and uh, stuff. Uh, North Cadeli was the primary uh, attorney at that time, representing, you might say, California in, in, in that. And uh, it was really presented that way. And I participated to the same extent that other attorneys participated, but uh, we did not argue the case, and, nor did we submit a separate brief. Did you, uh, do you, do you recall what kind of the major issues were that the agency attorney sort of strategized about uh, with Mr. Ely, or were there? No, uh, at that time, as best I can recall, there was pretty, pretty much agreement that the 740 water agreement was within California, the rules of the game. And, uh, uh, Consequently, California was really united in, in, in getting water for California, and that was what everything was directed at. There really wasn't much, um, in fact, I don't really recall any friction at that during that period of time, uh, at least none that involved PVID. Of course, I never know what's going on between the other agencies. Um, a after the court's decision in 1963 and decree in 1964, uh, then I think there was a period of time where uh, a lot of work was devoted to trying to identify uh, and define uh, present perfected rights. And certainly PBID has present perfected rights. Do you yes. recall, you know, any... Yes, we did have the, the present perfected rights thing. In, uh, in PBID's case, there were pretty good uh, uh, evidences of, of, of what had been cultivated and uh, also the total amount of water that uh, that meant for PVID wasn't so great that it prevented agreement uh, on that. So uh, PVID received, uh, uh, you might say, uh, a 
a pretty fair bargaining position with regard to what they were claiming at the time. There wasn't much argument about what PVID's rights were. You had pretty substantial evidence, I guess. You you yeah. go all the way back to the yes. filings by uh, Thomas Blythe. And you, you probably, as anybody who's looked at this much, is probably already aware that the present perfected rights as determined by the Supreme Court was different than California law Right. Uh, when they finally came down. California law would have protected the prior filings uh, until they were perfected. And uh, there was some uh, recognition of that, particularly the Palo Verde Mesa, uh, in the agreement that the parties made. Then the Supreme Court came along and announced present perfected rights uh, to this day, I don't think there's agreement among the parties as to uh, exactly what present perfected rights are. Um, I, I think then after uh, the court's decree uh, in Arizona versus California, another major activity, I guess, during the uh, 60s then was uh, back in Washington with discussions about authorization for the Central Arizona Project and California's 4.4 uh, million acre feet entitlement and the priority of the California 4.4 uh, over the CAP and things like that. Did did you get involved? Well, very much I, in those I was involved in that and I uh, met the conferences several times and went to Washington several times on it, uh, meeting with other people and with people from the Department of Interior. But in all of these things, MWD was really the leader. They already saw themselves as being tail end Charlie on the water and uh, uh, as a consequence, uh, as long as they were willing to leave other people's water alone, so to speak, uh, stay out of controversies with them, MWD was able and did take the leadership on nearly everything that was coming up with the, with, with the United States. Do you recall who uh, was working for MWD on these issues at the time? No, I couldn't be sure about that. I, I couldn't be sure. Did the Colorado River Board have uh, a significant role, do you recall, in these discussions? Well, the Colorado River Board uh, had a significant role, in my mind at least, in the sense that it provided an opportunity for these agencies to meet and, and uh, cooperate with each other as, and, and has over the years I think avoided fights among the agencies themselves over the water. I think that, that the Colorado River Board really has helped a lot in, in that cooperation deal. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time I feel that they have allowed the uh, MWD uh, to take the lead on most water issues, uh, and again, because MWD was tail end Charlie, I think that was fair. Right? No one really had any objection to that, as again, as long as MWD left them alone. Uh, I, I recall reading recently some um, historical um, documents around the seven-party agreement uh, period of time, and I think that PVID at that time, or representatives for PVID, were taking the position that they ought to be allowed to transfer uh, their water rights. Did you ever have occasion to look back at some of those issues? No. Uh, during my time with PVID, I don't think any of the trustees have never brought up the subject of being able to transfer the water rights. Okay. As far as I know with them, it's been... they never thought of, of present perfected rights in that way. Okay. Um, uh, another major issue, I think, on the Colorado River generally during the um, early to mid-60s uh, um, are the some issues with Mexico and salinity on, on, the, on the Colorado River. Um, there was even, I think, in 1965, a, a minute uh, uh, issued by the International Boundary Water Commission about salinity issues. Did, did you work on that, or did PVID have any concerns well, about that? Well, uh, didn't really work on that myself. Uh, the 
Palo Verde Irrigation District, again, has been pretty much left alone in that. And part of that was caused by the actual salinity co contribution from the valley itself is, is relatively small because the valley was, uh, first of all, flooded all the time prior to the time that it began to be farmed. And uh, I understand there was even Indian farming in there on the flooded lands. And then after it started, uh, because there's always been return to the river, uh, and because they've been irrigating for quite some time, they already had pretty much leached the soil. So about all the mineral content that goes back into the river from Palo Verde is actual not leaching from prior deposits, uh, but just whatever minerals are left in the water after the plant takes the water out. And that's not been a real serious problem. Uh, the, the real problem that's been discussed a lot was the irrigation of lands that had a pre-existing salt content so that you not only were returning the, the, the salt that resulted from agriculture, but you were also returning salt that, in the process of reclaiming the land. So PVID has never really been in that category. Some reclaimed land existed at the in the Palo Verde Valley, but it wasn't extensive, so it's never been a real controversy with anyone. Okay. Um, operating criteria, I think in 19, uh, late 1960s, mm -hmm. early 1970s, uh, the Secretary uh, solicits views of uh, water users and the states and so forth on criteria by which uh, he should operate um, the rivers, or the river, actually. Um, did PVID have much of a role uh, in no, those discussions? No, not to my knowledge. They, they never took much of a role in the operating criteria. You see, Palo Verde Irrigation District, as long as nobody has challenged their first priority, uh, generally is in a position to sit back and look at those issues, leave those issues to the people that it, that it will influence. Right. Um, one, I guess, relatively uh, recent uh, issue where I guess there's been some discussion about uh, with regard to how uh, the priorities uh, flow, so to speak, would be the Endangered Species Act and what, if any, obligations do the agencies have despite their priorities. I think I've heard you express the opinion. Yes, PVID is uh, very concerned with the Endangered Species Act. Uh, PVID diverts water uh, into the canal directly from the river. And uh, uh, to the extent that uh, the, the river is considered a, a habitat for an endangered species, uh, it could be contended, of course, that the canals themselves are, in a way, an extension of the river. And, of course, they take water out of the canals. And they also return water to the river. So the, the uh, in involvement of the PVID is to uh, watch, again, that agriculture gets protected so that they can continue to operate. Uh, and uh, they, so they have been concerned uh, because every once in a while somebody pops up who uh, wants to take the endangered species to its extreme. Uh, for example, uh, at PVID, uh, in the canals, we don't see any dead fish, not ever. So taking the position that somehow the canal uh, damages endangered species is, is kind of hard to support if you don't produce any dead fish. And they just don't produce any dead fish. Uh, they do produce sometimes when they drain a canal completely, of course, because then they run out of water and whatever fish are involved in that. So uh, it's always been my assumption that, that uh, PVID is one way or another entitled to a, uh, whatever they call it, permit, uh, uh, limited or has some name. Anyway, that they'd be entitled to that. And what the problem for PVID has been, and still is, is that uh, if the final arrangement that is made requires uh, amounts of money to support endangered species uh, mitigation, uh, 
uh, PVID will be asked to make a large contribution because they use a lot of water, not because they hurt the species, mm -hmm. but because if the burden is cast on the people who use the water, uh, then PVID's share will be based on water rather than on any damage that they're doing to the environment or to endangered species. Although PVID's use of water in comparison to some of the other districts is not uh, it, it's certainly it's not as large as it's uh, quite a bit. imperial it's or a bit or larger than MWDs. <laughs> <laughs> um, one kind of interesting uh, transaction uh, that I recall uh, involving PVID related to providing water to a possible power plant. Uh, out in Blythe, as I recall. That yes, was San Diego Gas and Electric uh, came to the Palo Verde Irrigation District and they had plans to build an atomic uh, generating plant. Uh, and they were going to build it on uh, what is probably part of the lower Palo Verde Mesa, although again the boundaries of the Mesa are open to question. And uh, their proposal uh, was a very good proposal in the sense that what they wanted to do was take water from the Palo Verde drain. The Palo Verde drain is the high mineral content water that comes out of the district after it's been used for agriculture. And consequently, <coughs> the use of that water is much to be preferred over taking water directly from the river. Uh, depends on what they do with the, with the residue of their own cooling operations, but uh, that was a very good proposal. But does that reduce return flow credits? Well, uh, uh, it would reduce the return flow credits, uh, but Palo Verde Irrigation District is not, uh, uh, does not have a discrete amount of water which is entitled to divert from the river, so it would it would not affect that. And, and also, San Diego Gas and Electric at all times planned to get everybody's consent. They never mm -hmm. intended to build such a plant without everyone agreeing to it. Mm -hmm. But it was a good project because uh, they were going to take water from the drain and not require the use of good water, so to speak. Well, what, what uh, they also uh, uh, offered uh, and part of their project was to uh, take land in the, in the Palo Verde Valley itself. And uh, they were going to follow that land in order to justify the water that they were going to take out. So they made a deal with the PVID. PVID thought it was a good project. Uh, they, they also made uh, a number of arrangements with regard to uh, protecting the land and adjacent farmers. Uh, so they entered into an agreement with regard to that. They agreed to pay, continue to pay the water tolls. So overall, the, it was a deal which the district approved. Was this the first time that you recalled that a land fouling kind of arrangement was um, brought to the PEID board? No, that would have, would have been 40 years ago when I started suggesting <laughs> That, that MWD buy the land and, and uh, follow it if they wanted to. Uh, no, it has come up from time to time over the years. Uh, everybody has always realized that uh, uh, MWD being tail end Charlie, that if somebody upstream didn't use the water, it'd go to MWD. And oh. that was one way to do it. Tell us a little bit about PVID, I guess, it, itself and in, in some of the, um, I guess, uh, figures, leaders that, of PVID that stand out in your mind. Well, I think the main thing about PVID that uh, big city people might not understand is that PVID, while it is a public agency, really uh, is, is run by the farmers. It's a district of limited powers, and uh, they have stuck strictly to that. Uh, they don't do anything else. They provide water, so it's, it's kind of like a private water company, but it's a public agency. And uh, the board has always been comprised of, of uh, since I've been their attorney, 
the board has always been comprised of people who actually paid the, the fare the very people who pay the water tolls. When they, when they vote a water toll, they're the very people who are going to pay the biggest share of that. Uh, so that uh, uh, at all times, their policy really has been strictly the policy of the farmers themselves. It's, it's a very democratic uh, organization in that sense. Does the board, is it a one person, one vote board? Or no, the... it's a landowner voting district. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> they've always, now, uh, again, there's an interesting thing down there, which I'm sure MWD and their attorneys have studied. Uh, under the water delivery contracts, the city of Blyde doesn't have any contract. And all over the Palo Verde Valley, in addition to the city of Blyde, uh, there's uh, uh, other water companies. There are all individuals, uh, all those farms spread out away from the water system. <coughs> they all take water, and uh, the Bureau of Reclamation has decided that all that water is river water. Uh, now, if all that water is river water, then all these people are diverting water. And uh, uh, they do not have contracts with the Palo Verde Irrigation District. Uh, and Palo Verde Irrigation District does not in any sense furnish them with their water. Uh, so the Palo Verde Irrigation District has always, the board has always uh, realized that, that all these other people are also involved in this water deal. Uh, and they've had this balance which they've had to make, uh, so they have, uh, by and large, not taxed or relied on, on the city of Blythe or the other property owners. Uh, they have always had a very small tax because in its early days, PVID not only was a water district providing water, but it was providing flood protection as well and the flood protection, and they still do to some extent. Uh, the flood protection, of course, is for the benefit of everybody in the valley regardless. And as the water law has developed, as the rules of the game have developed, uh, the people in the valley, all of them, are dependent on the Palo Verde Irrigation District's water rights. Uh, but the board has always, uh, you might say, put all the burden, or nearly all the burden, uh, of the district's operation on the farmers themselves. Tell us a little bit about some of PBID's leadership. I mean, recently, of course, uh, PBID lost Virgil Jones, who was a, a longtime leader uh, of PBID. Well, um, when you say Virgil was the leader of PBID, you're saying something about farmers that isn't correct. <laughs> uh, a board the PBID board, anyway, uh, being composed of farmers, uh, they are uh, independent people. Uh, they uh, don't get led very well. Uh, it's like the uh, uh, commercial uh, where they're trying to herd cats. Uh, herding the, the farmers is is kind of like that. They're, they're independent and very strong. So when you talk about PBID leaders, uh, they have um, uh, had some leaders. Dana Fisher, who, was, who died now two or three years ago, uh, while he was active, was very influential on the board. Uh, and um, uh, others they have never, they've always been a hands-on management thing, too. Uh, if you go to a, a PVID board meeting, uh, one of the trustees is liable to raise the question that out there six miles away where he has a piece of land, somebody has uh, broken through and is draining water into the canal, will they take care of that, please? Uh, that sort of uh, attention to it. Uh, they, uh, uh, are very close on the management itself. They know who the employees are, uh, and so it's an unusual kind of situation in, in that the leadership on the board uh, 
trustees there is kind of the board itself. Now, that's not to say that some individuals on the board haven't uh, exerted more influence over it. And um, uh, Virgil Jones uh, is a, or was, pardon me, uh, a, a very persuasive type of person, and but easygoing, uh, not a dictator type at all. And uh, he was uh, uh, a long time uh, leader, but but without followers. <laughs> he he was on the board for many years, right? Oh yes, sure, sure. He was on the board many years. Well, but but you also have to realize that in a landowner voting district, the large farmers can elect themselves to the board. And they do. Do the uh, uh, do the board meetings draw a lot of uh, public input from the uh, other farmers? Uh, come often to the PVID board to no, express their views. No. Uh, generally, my experience with PVID would be that a landowner with a complaint approaches one of the board members themselves, and the board member brings it up. Very seldom does anything come up at the board. Uh, that they didn't know about. And uh, there have been almost no times during the time that I've represented them uh, that there have been any hostility evident uh, from any appreciable group of people. There are always somebody who disagrees with something, but uh, generally speaking, no, there haven't been any real dissent on it. They, they've always looked at their job as furnishing water. And that's what they do, and and they don't do much else. I mean, they try not to do anything else. Um, my recollection is uh, most of the farmers, so to speak, in PVID are they're not absent. There are not a lot of absentee landowners in PVID, are there? I mean, most of them are I, are they? I really can't answer that. I, I I never I don't know of a of a survey. I know that there are uh, now in the Palo Verde Valley, a number of uh, 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 corporate ownerships, uh, and I guess you'd call those absentees. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally speaking, farming is a hands-on operation, and generally speaking, whoever would be on the board would be somebody that was involved in the hands-on operation. Mm -hmm. You have, uh, I, I would imagine in PVID there are uh, families where the land is sort of passed from generation to generation to some extent. Yes, um, there are some. The but again, as far as I know, nobody's ever made a record of any of that. Anyway, other leadership that you wanted to ask about, um, uh, other people that I remember, there, there was a man named Underwood who was uh, chairman when I uh, came there first. Uh, and. Uh, he was a good leader. The presidency of the board has, has varied over the years, uh, and the board was pretty steadily the same people for many years. There was very little change in the board, and that's because it's a landowner voting district. Right, it, it, and uh, with regard to staff management, that's also been relatively yes. stable. The, I the think. staff management, well, yes and no. They've changed managers several times uh, during the time that I've been. Uh, there was a man named Simpson who was the manager when I first came. And uh, then uh, uh, I believe he was replaced by, by, by uh, uh, John Blakemore. And then he was replaced by Virgil Jones. And oh, is that right? Virgil, Virgil was the manager, manager for a while? For several years because they couldn't find anybody else. Oh. And, and I, uh, I'm not kidding when I say that these, these people know what's going on at the district. They, they take a personal interest in, in things. They know where these things are that they're talking about. They know what the water distribution problem is there. They, they pay the bill uh, right. if they decide to spend money. So they're really hands-on. And they also contribute a lot themselves personally in the sense that they're all 
acquainted with farming in the valley and they're all acquainted with equipment and they're all acquainted with who the contractors are and so forth. So uh, in, a, in a sense it's a farm cooperative sort of thing to supply water. What, do you recall when Jerry Davison came to PVID? Well, he came to PVID, I think, maybe in the late 60s. He wasn't manager when he came. He came to work there as an engineer. And he was, so to speak, promoted to manager uh, when John Blakemore left. And uh, so my guess is he'd been the manager I was the manager beginning, let's see, when is this? Uh, mm -hmm. I think he was the manager by 1980, uh, maybe, maybe late 70s. Well, I, uh, in all the time that I worked for Matt, which I began in 1981, I guess, um, until Jerry retired, I mean, he was the manager, he was the only manager when you I came. knew. Yeah, so okay. I can well, then, so. then I'd say it was from late 1970s he had become manager. He followed John Blakemore. So there's there was, there's a period of great stability there, I guess. He was there for well, quite some time then. The, the, uh, the way the board operate, uh, has always operated, is they, they've been so much hands-on uh, that uh, a good bit of the manager's time is spent uh, trying to do what the board wants done as opposed to manager planning what what the district should be doing. <laughs> well, as you say, they're paying the bills. They're uh, paying the bills. So they have a, a real interest in everyday activities. And they also know what's going on. It's, it's not a matter of people butting into things they don't know about. They do know about the district and, right. and the land in the right. district, who the farmers are. Whatever happened, by the way, with your first uh, efforts on helping to develop the Mesa, did that project ever...? Well, it came a cropper, and uh, it, it came a cropper. We had arranged uh, for the financing. Uh, we had arranged for the uh, contractor. We had a contractor willing to build it, and uh, we had the... Uh, draft plans, draft engineering plans, we didn't have the final plans, too expensive at the moment. And uh, we got stopped when uh, Imperial Irrigation District and Coachella and perhaps MWD, we never knew the details of course, lobbied uh, the Department of Interior to refuse to allow us to cross government land. And uh, the Mesa was checkerboarded with um, government land that had not been entered and so it was impossible to build the project uh, without the government's consent and they refused and that was that. There was no way to build the project. So a number of the desert land entrymen went ahead and drilled wells and irrigated their land with wells uh, and uh, um, some there was some land which could be irrigated by pumping up from the toe of the mesa uh, and uh, not crossing government land, and they did that. So what's now operating on the mesa is all operating without the necessity of crossing government land. Do you recall about when that all came about? That would have been in the 60s, but I can't pin it down more than that. Did that relate to, uh, I recall uh, reading recently about um, a, a policy that the Department of Interior had called the Ritter-Bunn Doctrine, which I think, I, I couldn't quite figure out actually if it just related uh, to the area in, in, in Imperial County, but the principle I think was the same, that you couldn't get rights of way across federal lands if the purpose of that was to essentially help you to develop land that would utilize Colorado River water. And I think it was in the late 19, maybe 1967 or 69 or something thereabouts. Sounds familiar. Where uh, <laughs> that, that might have no, occurred. No, no, it, it sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just trying to figure out whether... That was the result of that. You see, but, but the thing is that uh, 
I understand, I didn't research it myself, uh, that uh, Imperial Irrigation District did obtain rights away across government land oh. after this. <laughs> I see. Um, well, let's see, in the uh, eight, late 80s, I guess early 90s, uh, Metropolitan and PVID uh, do get together and negotiate a test land fouling. Yes. program, uh, which uh, I think resulted in about 180,000 acre feet or thereabouts uh, of water by over a two year period by taking uh, about 20 percent of the land uh, in PBID out of um, uh, irrigation. Uh, do we recall uh, any uh, significant issues, I guess, or issues of concern? Uh, at uh, the time that those agreements well, no, were negotiated? Well, no, or uh, MWD assured them that it was not a precedent for anything. In fact, wrote that into the contracts. <laughs> well, it was a test. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> yes, I recall that quite well. What, what that's all about, really, is that, that uh, the same thing that you've seen all over Southern California, uh, farmers uh, are businessmen. Uh, even small farmers are businessmen. And when they are offered money, which uh, is more than they can possibly make farming, uh, they take it. So we have less everything, and uh, a project like the following uh, they can't resist uh, because they are fundamentally business. They can't stand on principle and say, hey, I'm not going to do this. There are some who do, uh, but generally speaking, they look at it as a business proposition. And it was a business proposition. Do you recall uh, the, the community, so to speak, or perhaps uh, the city of uh, Blythe leadership or anyone uh, being concerned or well that that original program didn't create much of a stir <clears throat> it was temporary uh, MWD was going to store the water I think the water was eventually lost completely I think MWD just wasted the money except as a precedent <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, no, it didn't create much of a stir at the time. Uh, I think it was done very quickly. It was supposed to be, a, uh, not secretly at all, but uh, it, it didn't take any period of time, didn't receive much publicity at the time, and uh, really was unopposed by either individual farmers or the district. They all clamored to get in on the money. <laughs> well, uh, I guess as you say, they're, they're business people and they have to look at the economics of, of things, and uh, here was a potential well, guaranteed only, source of income. But look, I, you know, in the, in the same time period, you can't blame those farmers when you see what's happened to citrus. I mean, uh, pure and simple, how can you turn down $100,000 an acre when you can only make two or $300 an acre off of it farming? Right, right. You can't do that. Uh, so. Uh, it's just the same thing exactly has been going on all over Southern California. Tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts on the Colorado River Board. A little earlier, um, you talked about uh, you know one of the useful things which they've done over the years is to provide, I guess, a forum for the agencies to try and work out you know some of the issues. Uh, the board uh, has had some uh, colorful. Uh, folks uh, that have uh, been both staff and, and board members. Do you recall any that well, particularly uh, stand out? Uh, <clears throat> do any of them stand out? In your mind. <laughs> in, in my mind. Uh, <laughs> For any reason. <laughs> um, no, I, I really wouldn't say any of them stand out. Um, the, of course, those individuals stand out that the circumstances make stand out sometimes. Uh, I've really felt the Colorado River Board's main effectiveness, uh, first of all, uh, the staff 
has provided a means by which uh, communication is kept up with the government and other states on essential items. And without that, uh, I don't know just who would do it. Uh, dealing with the individual contractors doesn't really work because it affects all the contractors. And so having the staff uh, available to, first of all, compile the information, to be the communications and so forth, I think that's been really good. The other thing I think that's been really good about the Colorado River Board is people will not do to your face what they'll do behind your back. And having the uh, interested California parties uh, belonging to the same group and having a leader from each group or a representative from each group there, uh, I think enables them to work out things that might not have been worked out if it hadn't been for the Colorado River Board. So I think it's done some good internally as well as externally. Its powers are theoretically limited to uh, dealing externally. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's served a real purpose internally, I think, in, in that it's gotten a lot more cooperation between everybody than would otherwise have been a result. But as far as outstanding leaders go, uh, I don't think on the board itself there really have been outstanding leaders. Uh, I think that the staff from time to time has, has done a really good job. Um, as you look back on, gee, nearly 40 years, I guess, of, of work uh, representing PVID on various Colorado River matters. Um, what, what do you think it's 40 is, years this year, you see. That's right. What, what do you think is uh, the most uh, significant accomplishment or the one that you're perhaps proudest of? Of me? Yes. Palaver Irrigation District is still entitled to the same amount of water it was when I came. <laughs> <laughs> and that will be your legacy, is that right? <laughs> no, my legacy is about to fall. And wh why is that? Because they're about to contract to give it away. Uh, I'm not sure I understand that. I... They are in the process of negotiating a contract in which Oliver Irrigation District first priority water will go to MWD. Uh, but through a land management or a fallowing arrangement that of course if you don't have the water you can't farm <laughs> it just depends on the order in which you look at um i, I uh, didn't realize when we first began and you started talking about uh, how you sort of started off in in uh, the water arena you mentioned don stark and you know one of your founding partners mr clayson um, can you just tell us a little bit about, do you have other, uh, have you worked on other water issues, non-Colorado River related? Oh, sure. In, in this area, when I first came here, uh, there were still a lot of water problems in the sense that who's got the right to the water. Uh, and so we represented various clients. We even had clients fight over who gets the water from a particular well. Uh, we had uh, the uh, Chino Basin uh, litigation in which uh, uh, Don and uh, George and I participated. Uh, we have, uh, as I say, water companies that we've represented. Uh, they've been gradually drying up uh, as uh, public agencies have taken them over but uh, representing a number of small water companies and the fights, there were fights about uh, oh, um, a private water company interfering with the distribution proposals uh, or systems of a public agency or a public agency interfering with a private agency. Uh, there have been uh, the organization of uh, various water companies uh, uh, to take care of it, uh, that is to provide water for particular areas. Uh, we went through all this thing with development and the, you, the mutual water companies. We used to form mutual water companies in order to provide water to tracks. We did that a lot. Uh, but as time has gone by, uh, the rights to water themselves uh, has kind of dried up in the sense that it's pretty much settled. You, we very seldom anymore have disputes between people as to who owns the water. 
it's all pretty much settled uh, in this area anyway. And so most of the water work now involves uh, administration, uh, uh, trying to comply with all the laws, trying to worry about environmental problems, trying to uh, it doesn't involve water at all except indirectly. Um, has your own practice been primarily through all these years, though, water, uh, water no, based? No, or? I would say my primary practice over the years has been uh, business and corporate practice primarily. Oh, I see. Well, a as you look back um, on water issues generally, um, do you think that the uh, developments and the evolution of, uh, of water rights uh, in California has been um, uh, it, it, did it go in the right direction, so to speak, or? Did it go in the right direction? <laughs> um, I do feel, as I s said earlier, that uh, nobody is looking out for food production the, uh, in California. Uh, everyone seems to be assuming that food is going to come from somewhere else or that some magic is going to come up and all these uh, groves and trees and fields that are, that are disappearing, uh, somehow production will be met. And uh, I, I don't think that's good. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know any solution. I can't think of any solution for this because people are people. They're doing this, and uh, that, and and PBID is involved in that to some extent now, uh, because um, uh, basically uh, the Southern California metropolitan area wants more water, and they don't give a darn about whether that gets rid of agriculture or not. And uh, uh, the farmers, uh, they can't care. They're business people. They're, they're, they can't stand on principle. They're not going to, and if they, if, if they do hold out, their kids will give in. Uh, <laughs> so that part of it, I, I think, hasn't been headed in the right direction. I think uh, uh, some uh, better arrangement for the production of agriculture of course, what that means is only that people will have to pay more for food. If they did, then farmers wouldn't sell. But mm -hmm. that's not happened, and that's the way it is. Um, as you think a little bit about the future, and um, you know, right now there are so many um, uh, events uh, that are occurring or, or may occur with regard to the. Colorado and the future of how the water is allocated and all of the various arrangements. Um, uh, what, what do you think the future holds for the Colorado River, I guess, generally? Um, for the Colorado River, well, the water, as so many people have said, is the lifeblood of Southern California. I don't see any chance that the population will not continue to increase. So I think the future is to drive agriculture out of Southern California. Do you think that uh, an option to that might be to look a little bit more to the upper basin uh, states and, and think about uh, renegotiation of compact or? One time at the, uh, at the, uh, Colorado River Water Users Association a meeting in Las Vegas. Uh, the uh, then president, I can't remember who he was, gave a speech and uh, he welcomed everybody. And part of his speech was that I'm glad to see all my friends from the other states and all the water agencies here today. And I've been coming here for 20 years. I've gotten acquainted with all of you. He says, and I, I, I can call all of you friends. And he says, I, I, I've, I've learned that, that you really are nice people, and, and uh, he says, and good friends. And he says, and you know, he says, I could trust all of you with my wife. 
but I couldn't trust one SOB with a bucket of water. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the situation. I mean, water is it. And um, I, I, I don't know any other solution. I think people will use up the water and unless they find some way to make water, which is possible. Well, at one time there were cloud seeding. Uh... No, no, I mean it's possible that they will, will be able to economically to, to afford getting water from the ocean. Oh, I see. But the problem is that, that uh, who will protect farming? Who will protect food production? Who will do that? And there isn't anybody. You. No. <laughs> uh, I'm bowing out. I, I'll drink my share of the water and <laughs> and let it go at that. But I, it seems to me that's the inevitable result of what's going on. I, I just don't see how society can uh, manage, so to speak, to perfect some kind of a zoning law or something which says, no, no, we've had all this we're going to have, we're, we, we, we can't have any more people, uh, we've got to have food production here, uh, and because everybody is always optimistic and everybody always assumes that they'll go to the market and never, it'll all be there. And you can't ask the farmers to be the ones who are going to hold out. We talked earlier about, uh, you know, one of the things that you're you're proudest of, so to speak, is that PBID has the same amount of water uh, today that it had when you began 40 years ago. Uh, is there anything else uh, that you can think of that you'd like to be remembered for one day? With regard to PBID, you mean? Well, with regard to water <laughs> issues, shall we say. <laughs> well, with regard to water issues, uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, um, everything that I've worked on has just been what I would regard as routine over the years. Uh, you, you, I've learned a lot of things that are no longer useful. Uh, I know a lot of water law that nobody needs any more <laughs> <laughs> because as I say in Southern California at least the right to water as such is pretty much settled uh, the last in K air client that, that I was asked to do anything for um, was to inquire about a water right to a well and there wasn't any question about who's who, who, who had the right to that water. And that's pretty much what it always comes down to now, is that you almost never investigate a water right without being able to discover who has the right to that water. But even though some of the things that you, you, you think are no longer useful for anyone to know, uh, the fact is that water rights had to evolve to that stage. I mean, you were involved in a very important phase of water rights development by helping to figure out who who did own the water so that it can move to the next level uh, yes, of development. Yes, we were involved in, in getting it settled, but, but it's pretty much settled. And, and, and I think the reason for that is because the water is being used up. Right. You see, even 40 years ago, there was still water, literally, that no one was using. Which could be appropriated. Yes, which, which somebody could use. And, uh, and water was being used for some surplus usage that people really didn't need one way or the other. And, but uh, the economics of water has just caught up with that. And, and so now, uh, more and more, all the water has been spoken for, and legally spoken for, and so forth. So it's very seldom now that, that you can't tell who owns a particular water right. right, right. Well, uh, I think I've covered all of the things that uh, I want to cover. I want to thank you for taking the, the time to share your thoughts with us. Do you have any concluding thought that you'd like? Uh, no. <laughs> I really don't have any concluding thoughts. I, uh, I do feel that California has done a pretty darn good job 
in terms of, of the Colorado River and, and getting the water used and getting it transported. And, and I, I appreciate uh, the time that I've been working on it in the, in the fact that the agencies who are entitled to this water have avoided fighting with each other and have joined in trying to get as much water as they can. Okay, great. Thank you so much.